Our speakers tonight are PGAS members Kathy Schollenberger and Barry Stahl. Both of them have been trained as master gardeners and master naturalists, and they've worked as Audubon ambassadors for the Wildlife Sanctuary Program of the Northern Virginia Audubon Society. Barry is a retired horticulturalist. He is a tree commissioner for Mount Rainier, Maryland, and a board member for Chesapeake Natives Incorporated, which if you don't know is a nonprofit located at Roseville State Park and they supply native plants that are um, ecotones for our region. Kathy is a retired teacher, a lifelong gardener, and a PGAS board member. Together with um, the PGAS board, and also in working with Aaron Reed Miller, who is the education manager at Patterson Park Audubon Center in Baltimore, Kathy and Barry have laid the groundwork and provided the leadership for a nascent program in um, creating wildlife habitat at home. So without further delay, I'm turning it over to Barry and Kathy. Okay. We're going oh, to see and I did forget to say, if you have questions during the um, presentation, please feel free to put them in chat and I'll be reading them as we go along. We'll probably wait for questions until the end, but if there's something pressing, I might break in and interrupt Kathy and Barry. So please use the chat for your questions. Thanks. Okay. Are we good? Can you see us? Can you see the screen? Yes, Kathy, we're good. Yep. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to make sure. Um, so I'm Kathy Schollenberger, and if you could see him, I'm sitting right next to my husband, Barry Stahl. Our focus, unlike many of your speakers, will not be birds, but rather bird-friendly habitat. We hope to convince you that you cannot have one without the other. We are merely backyard birders, always awed at the collective bird knowledge at these meetings, but we know birds have a problem and we're asking you to help with the solution. We're very pleased to be here. So let's start with the problem. Research indicates that loss of wildlife habitat is threatening our ecosystem health. Much of this research has focused on bird decline. That's where we'll start. It's a story of habitat loss in Prince George's County and everywhere else. Unfortunately, it's a bad news story. So bear with me, the good news will come. Let's start with this wood thrush the DC state bird, by the way. It winters in Costa Rica, flies across the Gulf of Mexico, and as I'm sure you all know, sounds like this. So lovely. So, where are we? This might help a bit. This is what our thrush saw on its journey about a hundred years ago. Lots of places to stop, rest, and refuel. Nowadays, this is how it looks. Much less forested, with habitat fragmented, degraded, and often removed with a huge increase in pervious surfaces. This makes finding those places to stop along the way tough for our thrush. Here we see lights at night when most birds migrate. They get lured towards cities, distracted and disoriented by these lights, and they circle until they're exhausted, often needing a place to land. Hopefully our thrush will find a place like this, a little oasis of habitat. Doesn't look good though, the wood thrush population is declining by 2% a year. The wood thrush is only one of many Eastern forest birds in decline, 170 million lost since 1970. The thrush figures in this statistic as well, 
2.5 billion migratory birds lost since 1970. All told, 2.9 billion North American birds gone since 1970. These birds are bioindicators. Bird decline is a harbinger of wider environmental woes. This decline is occurring for numerous reasons. Habitat tops the list. Much of what we know about the demise of habitat and the problems it spells for the planet comes from the work of Douglas Tallamy, professor of entomology at University of Delaware. This is his latest book, Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. He begins by laying out the bad news and it's pretty bad. He paints the picture like this. 95% of the country has been developed. Log drained, grazed, tilled, paved. Rivers have been straightened and dammed. Some no longer even reach the sea. Our air is polluted, our aquifers are dry. Our native plant communities have been decimated by imports and the natural world has been carved into tiny remnants. So that's the bad news. Barry gets to deliver the good news. <laughs> so what is the solution to this terrible problem that Kathy's been laying out? The good news is that the solution is us, each one of us. Everyone can do something. You can work on your own backyard. You can ask for a visit to have someone come and give you advice on your backyard. If you're already knowledgeable, you can be a habitat advisor and help others to create habitat. Ptolemy once again lays out how to create habitat and he calls it the homegrown national park. I'll read this quote. What if each American landowner made it a goal to convert half of his or her lawn to productive native plant communities? Every moderate success, even moderate success, could collectively restore some semblance of ecosystem function to more than 20 million acres of what is now ecological wasteland. So our goal through this program is to create a wildlife network using spaces over which we have control, our own homes and the homes of our neighbors. So what will this homegrown national park look like if indeed we're successful in making it happen? This is where we are now. Again, think of that thrush. It's a desert. There's no place for it to land and get nourishment. It's mostly lawn with some shrubs from Asia and from Europe, nothing of real benefit to wildlife. Whereas something like this would be so much more attractive. Even in scorching sun, surrounded by sidewalks and driveways and streets. There are native plants that have adapted to these conditions and making the home beautiful and beneficial. Or a shady spot like this, where again, native plants are adapted to those conditions. These are gardens that are teeming with life, unlike the desert of the present conditions that we showed you from the thrush's view. These are planned landscapes. There's a little bit of grass path you can see here. There's a patio, there's a bird bath, but most of the space is devoted to native plants. And that's what's the most benefit to wildlife. Even a small space like this along a narrow strip along the house can be converted into beneficial landscape. They can even be formal, these gardens like this, not with clipped hedges, like European style, but with native American plants in a more formal setting. Again, with paths and patios and places for us to inhabit, but places that are surrounded by life. <laughs> and no space is too small. Even a container garden provides benefit to wildlife. Even a windowsill, a window box can be a place for pollinators, for birds, for other wildlife to get nourishment. And anyone can do this. So these are the current conditions as well. Our houses that have lawns in front and nothing else. And within a couple of years, these people have managed to convert the front of their house into a lush landscape. 
So how are we getting this homegrown national park started in our county? We're convincing individual property owners that they have the power to make a real difference. Take a look at this New Yorker cartoon. The first two trolls are arguing about their garden. The third troll has a point. There might be bigger things to worry about than gardening, but there's another way to look at this situation. It's a great time because in a world that appears to be even more out of control than usual, this is something each of us can control. We can control our own little piece of property. It's really, if you think about it, kind of revolutionary. We don't have to create a petition or lobby our state legislature or get just the right person elected. We can just do it. So the second thing that we're doing to get this homegrown national park started is to offer homeowners individual site-specific advice and support to help them envision and realize their own property's transformation into part of a park. We're building on what the National Audubon Society is already doing. This t-shirt shows its new focus. Birds tell us, act on climate. Audubon is on the cutting edge here. The National Office has made bird-friendly habitat its priority. This national focus is called bird-friendly communities. It urges planting native with excellent online support. So with bird-friendly habitat doings in the air, it's perfect timing for an excellent collaboration. Patterson Park Audubon Center in Baltimore City was already running a bird-friendly habitat program with a certification process in place. We joined forces and added the offer of a consultation for PG County residents. Are habitat advisors really necessary? Can't would be wildlife gardeners find everything they need online? After all, there's a wealth of information. Just look at this first step in a search for information on bird friendly gardening. One click, six articles. However, that wealth of information can cut both ways. It can be really, really helpful, but also potentially overwhelming. So does everyone need a habitat advisor? No, not everyone needs an on-site visit. Some folks will know enough already to find out what it is they need. We are focusing on the others, the people who for whatever reason are unlikely to manage this without some kind of help. A visit can be so empowering because it's tailored to fit. It's about the power of individual conversation. It's about a specific outdoor space and a specific set of circumstances and then about together developing a specific vision that fits both the homeowner and their space. Habitat advisors will and are already doing these things. They do an on-site visit about an hour long. They provide the client with supporting materials both during and after the visit. They write a site report for the client they offer further help as needed, and they encourage the client to apply for Audubon Wildlife Habitat recognition when ready. It's also about education. This is the folder of materials that we give to each homeowner, and it represents the fact that in addition to jump-starting homeowners, we focus on education using a set of guidelines we have developed. Barry will talk you through those guidelines. So when we visit people's homes, we go into how they can create wildlife habitat. We're teaching them the elements that go into making a wildlife habitat. Certainly native plants, but there's much more. We use mother nature as our guide, our underlying principle, because a balanced system of relationships is what we're after. 
this cartoon, it says, it's backbreaking work, making a garden a nice place to relax in. And indeed, keeping up a lawn is backbreaking work and provides no benefit at all to wildlife. So the principal thing we're asking, as Ptolemy said when he was talking about the homegrown national park, encouraging people to replace half of their lawn with native plants. It doesn't have to be all be done at once. 10% a year for five years will get you to the same goal of a 50% reduction. <laughs> Why are natives so valuable? Well, it's about 90% of the birds who rely on insects and 90% of the insects that rely on specific plants that they've co-evolved with over many, many years. This milkwood and the caterpillar are prime example. Another example here, many of our gardens have nothing but plants from Europe and from Asia, like the Nandina domestica that's pictured on the left. On the right is vaccinium, our native blueberry. What are those numbers? Those are numbers of caterpillars that host on that plant. Zero for Nandina, 294 different Lepidopera on the vaccinium. It's quite a difference in terms of benefit to our habitat. And there are benefits to us as well as to wildlife. Native plants are easier to maintain. Uh, planting densely with them prevents invasives from filling in. They have beauty and diversity and a sense of place. Just think of our black-eyed Susans and that says Maryland right here. They also have the built-in benefit of biocontrol a natural form of controlling pesky insects. So when things are in harmony, things are buzzing. Native plants grouped like this in clumps are easy for pollinators to find and pollinators fill them and birds find the insects. Mm -hmm. So we encourage not just reducing lawn, but replacing introduced and invasive plants and have information for the people we visit like this chart, plant this and not that, with butterfly bush being a good example, which attracts lots of butterflies, but doesn't provide benefit for them, as opposed to a butterfly weed, the Asclepius, which also attracts butterflies, but provides lots of benefit for them. We encourage people not to use pesticides and fertilizers, but instead to rely on beneficial insects and leaf litter. It makes no sense to us to be attracting insects to our gardens only to have them killed off. When you're spraying to kill off mosquitoes, you're killing beneficial insects as well. And it makes no sense either to us to be buying red dyed, wood chipped storage pallets and using those as mulch when there are leaves right on your own property that should be kept leaves that are full of insects that birds are picking through all through the winter and benefiting them. We also encourage in these visits our clients to provide structure densely and in layers. Look at this chart on layers and it tells you different birds that are found in each layer and different plants that provide those layers. So for example, in the high canopy, you've got a place for hawks, for warblers, for woodpeckers, closer to the ground, wrens, robins, doves, etc. Each niche is important and we encourage people to plant in layers so that they're providing a niche for different birds, for different insects, other wildlife. We also encourage people to plant in clearly designated beds and use edging. There's always the uh, uh, danger, I guess you'd say, with, uh, with uh, native plants that people will turn it into a weed patch and get complaints from the neighbors. So we emphasize it's how important it is to have lots of native plants planted densely with great diversity, but also to have clear edging and clear paths to tell people this is the message. This is a well-managed plot. <laughs> we encourage our visits in our visits to provide food for birds, to emphasize the four 
uh, food groups, berries, nuts and seeds, insects and nectar that birds and pollinators rely upon to leave their seeds over winter, the grass seeds for, uh, for birds to eat all through the winter time. And when it comes to feeders, this is probably the thing that people know most about attracting birds, but we like to emphasize how feeders are supplements. Native plants are the main food for birds and that some birds don't even eat seeds and that uh, feeders need to be cleaned regularly and that feeders are really great for engaging human contact with birds and human sighting, but it's mostly about us and the native plants are mostly the food that the birds need. Other wildlife will be attracted when you plant native plants as well, like this toad, who's a good friend, eating slugs and crickets and grasshoppers and other things that we don't want in our gardens. And other wildlife will be attracted. Think of the possum and how many ticks a possum eats. How great is that to attract to your garden? We also emphasize providing shelter and housing for uh, on our visits. Um, and uh, this brush pile and the snag are examples of things that are not just living plant material, but decaying or dead plant material that provide lots of benefit for birds to nest and birds to hide from predators. We emphasize keeping water on site and setting aside some water for wildlife as well. So installing rain barrels and rain gardens and maintaining bird baths and to tell people that there is help for adding rain, adding water conservation to their garden through, for example, this Prince George's rain check rebate program that'll actually pay people to keep the water on site and to use it well. And lastly, to provide safety and safe haven for wildlife. When we make these visits, we encourage people to keep their cats indoors or control them and tell them about how many birds are killed by cats. We encourage them to treat their windows to prevent collisions. And we encourage them to adjust their lights, lower their lights so that that doesn't interfere either. So all this is a big challenge. It's a lot to handle, but I'm gonna turn it back to Kathy and she'll tell you how we can do this. So right now you might be asking, can we do this? Or perhaps more to the point, if you're thinking about your own outside spaces, can I do this? We've found that homeowners respond to this endeavor with both great excitement and also some trepidation. Sometimes it's just hard to get started. It might be time for a little cheerleading. So can we do this? Yes, we can. It's time. We have to do this little by little, yard by yard. We can do this together. Ptolemy has certainly convinced that the time is right. He says we're on the cusp. I'm going to read these words of wisdom from him. Despite the current political climate, I believe we are on the cusp of a new environmental ethic, one that will, must be adopted, not just in blue states, but in red states as well. Not just by tree hugging environmentalists, but by everyone. Things are happening. They really seem to be coming together. Um, and, and I'm gonna give you two examples of further proof that we're on the, on the cusp, two things that are happening. One is that, um, that, that the Maryland state legislature just passed a law that says basically that anyone living in a homeowners association in Maryland will no longer be able that those homeowner associations will no longer be able to require you to plant turf grass or prohibit native plants and wildlife habitat. So basically what it's done is to establish a new right to be wildlife friendly. That will start in October and I think will make an enormous difference. Another example is in the town where Barry and I live, Mount Rainier, Maryland, our city council has started a native plant network um, and it is part of a larger collaboration with Maryland Sierra and 
we hope will become kind of a model for other towns. So things are happening. We really are on the cusp. Everyone in this audience can participate in one way or another. If you have an outdoor space, you can start to transform it. You might not even know where to start. You can plan a small area like this and voila, see what can happen. What a difference. You can get, a, get help from a pair of habitat advisors if you need a jump start. If you already have wildlife habitat on your property, you can apply for Audubon Wildlife Habitat certification. Get your sign and start neighborhood conversation. Wildlife gardening looks so different from the norm, that sign is good to have. It legitimizes your efforts and connects you to a national organization. It says, what I'm doing is of value. You can use your sign to start conversation with your neighbors. You become part of an ever-growing network of bird-friendly habitat in Maryland. This is a map of Audubon improved gardens so far, but they're, we're adding to them all the time. Once you've made some headway in your own garden, you've got your own wildlife gardening underway, you can start branching out into your community. Maybe team up with neighbors and divide plants and swap. If you've got the work on your own property kind of under control, what's the next step? Well, you could branch out to public spaces like this, um, like this tree box, or perhaps a median strip somewhere near you, which offers nothing to pollinators and birds. You might also help us. We're starting with individuals, but perhaps you can help us to include schools, places of worship, and businesses. Maybe you're personally committed to a faith community or a school where you could imagine getting folks interested in creating bird-friendly habitat. Or maybe your place of work has an outdoor spot. Remember, no space is too small. Or as Barry suggested earlier, perhaps you have gardening or naturalist experience you'd like to put to good use. You can sign up to be trained as a habitat advisor this coming August and start visiting properties in the fall. I can tell you based on my own experience that it is very, very satisfying work. It all starts here, one yard at a time. As Talmi says, it's nature's best hope. Please find a way to join this movement. Here's how to get in touch. That's it. Thank you very much, Kathy and Barry. Uh, your slides are beautiful. And I hope that everybody here, I think everybody here was probably inspired by your talk. We do have some questions that have come into the chat. So let me just go through those. Um, Let's see, I'm scrolling down. Um, Tacey uh, mentioned that she lives in Montgomery County and she heard you say, Kathy, that you and Barry are only working in Prince George's County as habitat advisors. Um, do you have somebody in Montgomery County that you could refer Tacey to? Unfortunately, we don't, um, but I'm hoping that someday we will. There isn't, there really, there, there is this kind of program in Northern Virginia. Montgomery County has Woodend, which isn't connected to the National Audubon Society. Um, and, and they don't offer this particular kind of program. Um, but um, clearly there's a need in a lot of other places. So hopefully it'll catch on. Um, well, maybe this is a good time for me to mention something that's sort of related and supportive of your project. And there hasn't been a public announcement on this yet, but you'll be hearing about it soon. Um, at Patuxent Research Refuge, the Friends of Patuxent, which I'm part of and Ken Cowan is also on the board. Um, Friends of Patuxent is embarking on a project 
in partnership with the refuge and with the wildlife research center and also with a group called the Lynx. The Lynx is a national service organization of African-American women. And the Prince George's County chapter approached the refuge to ask if they, we, were interested in working with them on a pollinator habitat project. So after a couple months of discussion, what we've come up with is that this year, we're planting a demonstration container garden of pollinator plants. And we're doing that. We're doing it to demonstrate to homeowners that you can do big things in a small space. It's located on the um, back patio at the National Wildlife Visitor Center at South Tract. We may also do a plant yeah. up at um, North Tract, where you know there already is an in the ground pollinator garden. But anyway, um, along with the demonstration garden, we're developing handouts that people can take to take home and, and give them further resources. So um, you know, that's a place that people can come visit, see it, get inspired, and perhaps go home and reproduce it. Oh, that sounds great, yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really, um, they, they actually did an initial planting. We're growing a lot of the plants this year from seed. Oh, and I should say Sam Drogi, um, the, the bee guy, he runs the Native Bee Lab at uh, the Wildlife Research Center. Sam is an integral part of this project. He has um, native plant seeds that he's been overwintering and um, uh, keeping them under cold conditions and they're ready to get started from seed now. We're also contracting with some farmers in Southern PG County who are growing plants for us in greenhouses. And we've gotten donations of containers, so we're off to a good start. So we're thinking around June, um, we'll be out there on the patio with the container plantings. That sounds great. That's certainly something that we could let people know about. So we'll okay. stay in touch. I think we can cross advertise. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a question for you, Kathy and Barry. Can you give us a specific reference on that new legislation regarding the HOAs and lawns and plants and all that? I had not heard. I, I, I follow legislation and boy, I missed that one. I have, I learned about this from Sally actually, and it, I wrote down the, uh, the number and now I can't find it. Okay, um, if you could send me an email. I, I will. Right. Yeah, send me an email and then I'll pass it around to others. Um, and then there's another question. Ginger wanted to know how she can find out more information about the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network that you mentioned. Um, we can, if you email that, e email me, um, which is the email that was on the last slide, and I guess we can, we should probably put that in the chat as well. Yeah, what's, um, your, what's your email, Kathy? Um, it's Kathy, K-A-T-H-Y, K-9, at gmail.com, and um, and then we'll give you the information about the Native Plant Network. It's, a, it's very exciting. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and then Shalom asked, can you recommend any habitat advisors? Now that's you and Barry, right? But are there more? Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> again, if you email me, I'm for now the contact person, although eventually you would get an Audubon Wildlife Habitat email message because we've set up a separate account, but I'm the initial contact person at this point. And we now have 12 habitat advisors mm. who are, um, we have 25 visits we're doing in the next two weeks and we have 30 people um, we're scheduling for May. We'll um, continue a little bit in June and um, and then that we'll do signups, we'll do visits again in the probably late August and run all the way through the fall. There's been a lot of interest, um, but yeah, we're very, we're very excited about this. Um, you could send them an email and yes. ask for an advisor to come oh, out. Oh, it's just PG County. Yeah, I am. Just PG County, yes. Yeah, Fred and Jane are in um, Calvert County. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> out of bounds. 
But, mm -hmm. I, you know, I could be, my arm could be twisted to go and check out their property, Kathy. There you yeah, go. <laughs> I mean, I think we could find somebody. And the other thing that is- It already lives in Calvert County. <laughs> we're already lives in Calvert County. Yes, that would be good. I, it sounds to me like you just got an offer. Okay. Um, and Lisa was also asking in the chat if your training were advisors. Yes. Um, in August, we're hoping to train more advisors. And you know, one thing that I, I feel like maybe didn't we fail to say in the presentation is another thing that you could do that we would be for which we'd be very grateful is spread the word. Um, you know, talk to people about. Um, the certification program, um, because once it starts to build and people get signs, then it builds more, it builds on that, and talk to people about um, the possibility of having a visit. And if you know folks, or if any of you are um, interested in becoming a Habitat Advisor, I really, having done a lot of volunteer experience in my life, I think this has been the most satisfying. It's just it's this beacon of hope. It feels doable. It's um, people get very excited, and um, so we, you know, we need more. We need people for our next round. Um, so, the next question is from my husband, Jean Scarpola, who's upstairs. <laughs> he says, "We have lots of white-tailed deer that visit our yard. We back up to a conservation area, so we're, you know, open to." Quite an extensive area. And he says, Jean says, they devour natives and exotics alike. How sustainable would it be to plant native plants in our yard? Or would everything just be devoured? Mm. Well, there, uh, there are plants that are deer-resistant. Deer um, so one can get, uh, you can look online for deer-resistant plants. Uh, if you'd like, you can contact Kathy and uh, we'll get a list to you. Uh, of course, we all know if deer are hungry enough, they will eat anything. <laughs> but the deer resistant plant lists list plants that they're least likely to eat. And when planting uh, young shrubs and trees, uh, it's good to uh, put fencing around those and protect them. Um, they generally don't um, eat, uh, kill off the herbaceous perennials. Um, they're looking for, for trees and shrubs. And if you protect uh, young ones that you plant, until they grow out of reach, then you can grow trees, shrubs, and, and herbaceous perennials uh, in your garden. They don't seem to bother wild senna or bee balm very uh -huh. much. Good mm -hmm. yes. uh -huh. yeah, They don't like the spikier plants. It's it's like yes. really a texture. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I found like I leave a um I actually have a whole little patch of hosta for the deer to eat and the dogs to <laughs> on like in a sort of by one side so you could leave the lazy things that they do like sort of you know separate and and they will eat them same with the rabbits I mean I find that we have a whole like our yard is a whole perimeter now and so when you get to a certain point I mean it depends on really how many deer you have we don't have like herds of deer but we do get them coming through um then they you know they can't eat everything and you can always fill in patches or you know, the, you can take your volunteers and move them around. When, I mean, you have to not be very wedded to a particular plant in a particular place in this vibe, as we would call it, right? So like we get, so we have self, we have some things that are technically, I guess, self-seeding annuals. They're not really perennials, but we get new sprouts of them each year and we just take them out of the lawn and move them where we want them. Or if the deer have eaten down something, we divide something else and fill it in. And so, um, it's manageable, but but yeah, the deer do eat it, the rabbits eat it, but we have a yard full of clover for the rabbits. So it's like, you have to kind of, we don't try to plant vegetables, we've never have. So we we factor that into um, the whole approach is the assumption that the mammals are and the other things are also gonna come. But now we have foxes that chase the rabbits and the squirrels, so, and the chipmunks. So it, it um, you know, we've been here doing this 15 years and we're finally at a point where we have some predators, so. Anyway, sorry, I don't mean to hijack your thing. I'm very excited this program is coming to our area because- um, you're, you're picking yeah. back in, uh, on, on <laughs> what, what mother nature does when things things are in balance. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, this is a comment from Christina Bryan, not a question. 
She mentions that the School of College Park is in the process of applying to become a Bee City USA and planting native pollinator gardens will be part of this program. Um, and in that regard, I'll also mention that the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership is sponsoring cities, helping cities throughout our state who wish to become bird cities. And just like the Bee City program, bird cities um, emphasize native habitat. And I think we have three already. In four. Four? I know there's La Plata. Um, I can't think of the other one. Salisbury just became a bird city this weekend. They announced it. Okay. And what are the and, and La Plata, Salisbury, Mechanicsville? I think it was Mechanicsville. That's the Southern Maryland place. And um, Baltimore. Oh, okay. Well, good. So everybody's jumping in, which is very good. Um, it does kind of, it, it, um, it reaffirms that idea that things are happening. There are mm -hmm. all these things happening that are dovetailing and supporting each other and it's great. Um, I was gonna say there's a thing called Sustainable Maryland for municipalities in the state of Maryland and um, like College Park and Borough and Heights, there's tons of, tons of towns in the state of Maryland. And they changed the requirements this year, their innovative program requirements to include Bee City, Tree City, Bird City, um, Audubon Plants for Birds. If you can show that your town or municipality is doing these presentations, a plants, plant, which means that you people that love and nurture trees, plant community, um, those are ways to get extra points to be certified as sustainable communities. Mm -hmm. so that's pretty exciting. And I think it's really pulling it together, like Kathy was just saying. Yeah. It is. Um, Ginger was asking if we're going to send out a link to the recording that we're making as we speak. And yes, we will. Um, we're going to send out a link to it. And um, it's fine to share. I also wanted to ask Barry and Kathy if they would share a PDF of their actual presentation. And we can post the PDF on the uh, Patuxent Bird Club website along with the sure, link. We can do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for being so generous with your, your information. Um, and Sally, Sally mentions that um, it's a good idea when you go plant shopping to ask stores for native plants. She said she just did a little education with a salesperson at Home Depot. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's a reach to talk to Home Depot. But you know, there are there are um, lots of places, not lots of places, but there are good places around here that have native plants. And Barry, you want to say a little more about Chesapeake natives? Yeah, um, you can find a complete list of native plant vendors at the Maryland Native Plant Society website, MD Flora. Um, but the one that I volunteer in, the one that's close to, that's in Prince George's County and uh, and has a, a huge selection uh, and local ecotype, uh, all uh, grown from seed, not collected from the wild. Uh, that's Chesapeake natives in Upper Marlboro. Uh, at present, they're doing um, contactless uh, ordering online and, uh, and pickup. Uh, the store is open uh, Sunday through Tuesday for orders to be placed online and then uh, arrangements are made to pick up uh, Wednesday through Saturday. Um, it's um, really a very fine organization, a nonprofit, and uh, and wonderful plants at, at good prices. So highly recommend them. She's I highly recommend them too. I'm a customer. Talking about Liz and Jerry. I'm a customer, and um, I wanted to say also the website of Chesapeake Natives in the ordering section has great information about the plants. So if you're unsure. There are, there's wonderful little cards, online cards that have information about each plant. The other nursery that I use, uh, particularly for shrubby stuff, is Collar Nursery in um, Northern Hartford County up in Pilesville. And that's a hike, that's a, a long trip, but they have a great selection of native plants that they grow themselves and an extensive selection of both perennials and I, I like the, to get the woody shrubby stuff there. They also have trees, so they're great and very helpful. The owners are very knowledgeable. It's Collar, K-O-L-L-A-R. Let's see. Um, 
Nicole says, I, I don't know if everybody read this in the chat, there's a person in Mount Rainier who organizes a great plant sale every spring with many shrubs. They're inexpensive because they are small and you have to be willing to envision how they're going to look when they grow in over a few years. It, it turns out that, though, that the, the people who do that sale are Jerry Burgess and Liz Marshall and they have um, been trained to be habitat advisors. So um, they did not do the plug sale last year, but um, I know they're trying to figure out how to organize it for this year. I'm not sure where they are in that process, but Nicole's right, it's a really great sale. I really appreciate them because um, you know they're, the shrubs are so inexpensive that you, you can just buy a number of them and they have a different variety every year. And so we've added, um, like if I were going to a website, which I have done for specific things that I had in mind, you know, it's very daunting to think there's so many descriptions of different viburnums or whatever. But if you go to the shrub sale and you just take a couple of these and a couple of those and put them in the right um, place, then you have a yard uh, with berries in a couple of years. And it doesn't, um, I mean, it doesn't always matter exactly what they are if they're mixed in together and they're creating sort of a loose hedge. So um, she's been great for us. We really made great strides in adding shrubs because um, it was so easy to just choose something. <laughs> so. How would people, to Kathy and Nicole, how would people get information about that particular sale? Like, is there, how, how do you find out about it, the date and how to order um, whatever? She usually sends out an announcement to the Mount Rainier listserv, but also other local ones. Like I'm not on Mount Rainier, although my husband is, but like the Hyattsville, Usually there's a there's a sale announcement like a sort of flyer that goes out. Um, I don't know if she's doing it this spring. You know, I mean, with everything changing, mm -hmm. like you said, um, that's how I've seen it. I don't think they have a website. Do you know, Kathy? If they no, I don't think so. I think it's pretty informal. Um, we also just got an email about a couple of plant sales that are fundraisers. Um, and I don't have the information in front of me, but I can, we could pass that all along to you, Marsha, if you could yeah. then pass it on to other people. Sure. Yes, please okay. do. Okay. I'll, I'll make a packet that I can pass around and put on the website. Okay. Um, Barbara Hoff. Your PowerPoint. Yeah, that too. Um, Barbara Hopkins mentioned that the Bowie Croft and Garden Club is having a plant sale coming up. That's a mix of native plants and garden plants that aren't native. So, you know, you have to pick and choose what you get from there. Um, and then Lisa Garrett mentioned the town of North Beach is having a native plant sale. Um, let's see, what else? I think that's the end of the questions. And the recording has been going during this entire time. I'm going to stop the recording now.